Good morning and welcome to the Post Monetary Policy Committee press briefing. As is usual, uh, we have this press briefing after the Monetary Policy Committee meeting, which took place yesterday, the 23rd of November 2022. As we usually do, we'll have the Governor of the Central Bank of Kenya addressing you, uh, making his statement, and after that, we'll be able to take your questions. For you to get your questions through, please put them through Slido, that's www.slido.com. Uh, the meeting today is uh, hashtag MPC 1122, hashtag MPC 1122. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome and introduce the Governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, Dr. Patrick Jeroge. Good morning and welcome to, the, to this briefing following the MPC meeting that was concluded yesterday. You have already have, you will have already, you have, you'll already have seen the, uh, the press release that was issued yesterday. So this meeting, I'll provide you additional background information to give you the context, um, the underpinnings of the decision. And I'll start, as we usually do, with the global developments. Since our last meeting in September, policymakers in the advanced economies have reaffirmed their resolve to address the inflation problem in their economies. And they have redoubled their efforts. In, and uh, so far, they have been hiking rates aggressively and also communicated their objectives quite quite loudly and quite clearly, and uh, also indicated their future actions. So inflation still remains, uh, in advanced economies, remains high. We are trying to get a slide. Okay, there's the slide. Um, and has breached 10% in some of the uh, economies, as you can see, in the UK and indeed in the Eurozone. And it's true, the US uh, has the, the U.S. rate has uh, come down um, marginally to 7.7. Um, so the problem still remains. Secondly, the growth outlook has weakened. And here's a chart uh, that uh, relates to the, or is from the IMF. This is the World Economic Outlook um, numbers, projections that were done last October. And you can see relative to, say, the projections that were done in uh, January, um, global growth has been scaled back by about 1.2 percent percentage points for 2022. And indeed, about the same magnitude, 1.1 percent um, percentage points in 2023. Interestingly, of course, is the sub-Saharan sub Africa, um, which having scaled back by about 0.1% in uh, 2022. But I think the, the East African region um, has been actually stronger than was expected, um, but still ended up, at least for Kenya, scaling back the growth by uh, a marginal amount, which we will discuss a little later. So that is the context, the advanced economy, the problem of inflation in advanced economies. The point also is that the markets have been quite unsettled, jittery, volatile, with small bits of information leading to huge swings in, in, uh, in the outcomes. So for instance, in the last US uh, uh, CPI data that was, was sent out, 7.7, .7, um, it was better than was expected, and this led to significant movement in the both equities, in the financial markets, and indeed even on the uh, exchange rate, um, the U.S. dollar rate relative to the advanced economies that fell uh, by some amount. So there has been a lot of seesawing, pushing and pulling, as it were, between the fundamentals and the perceptions. By the way, these are not two different soccer teams. They are just various drivers of, uh, of uh, let's say, the outcomes in the financial markets. And bottom line is there's been increased fragility of the financial markets, which all of us have to deal with. There are two points I'd want to make. First, the very strong spillovers of policy actions by the advanced economies to the emerging market and uh, 
and uh, developing economies. So this has been through, for instance, the, 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 the channels are through, for instance, the strong dollar, um, through the fragile markets, etc. But this is expected to have spillbacks into the advanced economies, and, and uh, it appears that now the authorities in those economies, the advanced economies, are beginning to consider uh, the, the spillbacks, and therefore the implications of the spillovers of their policies into the uh, emerging market and development economies. The second point I would want to underscore is the, let's just call it inescapable laws of economics, meaning um, things have to follow uh, the laws as we understand them, as we study them, etc. And I think the best example here, a good bad example, is the UK experiment in September, October, um, in terms of the policies that were put on the table, which in the end were, were seen as weak um, at best, and uh, let's say also destabilizing as they did. So I think the point here is not so much to look at the specific policies, but to remind ourselves that uh, yeah, there are inescapable laws of, uh, of economics that we have to understand how the markets operate, etc. Another point I would want to raise, still in the global space, is the international crude oil prices. And here, as you can see, um, uh, this is the, a chart that shows the, our, let's say, our benchmark oil, Marban oil. The other benchmarks, and this is the one we have here in the, in the country. And you can see that the average so far has been 106 uh, dollars per barrel. The price now is uh, um, lower than that. It's at 86.4. Actually, this morning it is uh, a bit higher than um, what is shown here. But the point is that it has, as before, it was volatile, and now it's settling in the 80 to 100 region, or around 90. Um, so this is something, obviously, that we have zero control over. And we have been making the point that uh, it actually will drive our outcomes, both on inflation, etc. Finally, global commodity prices also, and the supply chain issues or pressures continue to ease um, from their recent peaks. This is a rather busy chart, but uh, one that I think I like, and definitely I'm sure you'd like. Um, and the point is it shows for most of these products, the peak was in Q4, Q2 of the year, so around April, May. So for instance, palm oil price, you can see it went up to 1717 uh, uh, dollars per metric ton. And now it is uh, south of half of that, yeah? So uh, it's now in October, it was 889. Um, and I think the point here is that uh, the, the increases that were there uh, were driven by other factors that uh, have nothing to do with us. Um, they are specific to those markets where we are buying from. And I think we do understand some of the factors, you know, the Ukrainian war, but I think war may war, war farther than just uh, that particular driver. So um, we obviously expect to benefit from these declines. Um, as the prices settle to maybe more normal range uh, of those prices. There's another slide as well on uh, the related to the supply chain challenges. This is the cost of uh, um, well, an, ind uh, an index related to the cost of a 40 foot container, um, transporting it uh, around. I don't remember how it is defined, but I think this is something that yeah, that is uh, available in the various uh, sources. And you can see it as it was up to $11,000 um, and now it's closer to $3,500. So again, also significant decline from the peaks that we saw in September of uh, 2021, even as we appreciate that this is still um, away from where it used to be, around $1,500, $1,700 per barrel, you know, back in the 20, well, before the crisis of uh, the COVID crisis, etc. So 
that's what I want to say about the conjuncture uh, related to the uh, global economy. And so we switch now to the domestic economy. And in May 2022, um, we warned about uh, the, the possibility of breaching our 7.5% threshold on inflation over the next few months. And in fact, since June, um, the outcomes have been higher than 7.5. And uh, now that also we haven't, we have actually acted um, and actually adjusted policy rates in May, September, and indeed just recently yesterday in November. You know that. But I think it is important to underscore, before we go to the numbers, to underscore that uh, we want to remain in a low inflation regime. Why is that? Because actually high inflation, if we move to a high inflation regime, um, it will be quite disastrous. Um, markets don't work well when you have uh, in a high inflation environment. But beyond that, households and farms begin to pay attention to individual prices. So I get concerned about the price of milk or the price of every single commodity. Um, and, and that in itself leads to sort of additional, let's say, um, well, additional channels where then I get to be more worried about my, my wages, what I'm getting paid, and uh, therefore you may end up having this sort of wage price spiral um, that will in itself will, is quite destructive. So it is important to appreciate why it is uh, we in the, well, this is not just our central bank, but around the world, the issue of inflation is significant. And it's also important to appreciate that uh, it leads to risks. It creates risks in places that are not so obvious. And consequently, you may end up having significant financial stability uh, issues also uh, popping out of this. But importantly, it affects the weakest members of our society the most. So that's why we, as a central bank, it is actually our mandate number one to deal with inflation. And, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why we have been quite clear that uh, we have to deal with inflation and make sure that it doesn't um, get an anchor, that inflation expectations don't run away. And indeed, uh, we do need to go back to the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the threshold, to, below, to the band that, uh, we, um, that we, we have in terms of uh, our target. So that's in terms of the background. But the numbers, uh, as was shown on the slide, um, the most recent numbers are October, and uh, you, I'm sure you've seen those numbers. 9.6 is the latest uh, number and uh, percent, 9.6 percent. And you can see it's been driven uh, largely by food and fuel prices, but largely food. So this is the contribution to overall inflation, and the blue is food. So you can see out of the 9.6 percentage points, 5.7 was really food and uh, 2.3 is uh, fuel. And as you know, we have been adjusting the price of fuel in terms of, uh, well, first was the remove of the subsidies. And then following the, uh, the trajectory of uh, the international prices. So we expect that that will continue going forward. That is, uh, eliminate whatever subsidies there are that may remain and uh, continue um, adjusting the price relative to the uh, international prices. Now, in terms of food, um, again, this is an interesting chart. It tells us that of four commodities only, wheat, milk, maize, and edible oils, these four commodities, they contribute 3.1 percentage points of the 9.6 that we mentioned a moment ago. So three commodity, four commodities contribute about a third. That is significant. So you can see, even as you talk food inflation, when we mention that that is what is driving the CPI, actually a lot of that is just three commodities. And we expect that some of these commodities will follow 
um, other cycles, as we have mentioned, or wheat, maize, milk, etc. So, just wanted to um, leave that with you. <laughs> Moving along, um, Okay, now we are moving to the, to the domestic economy and uh, now talking more about growth. And uh, we know that the first prints of uh, Q2 by the National Bureau of Statistics were circulated some time ago. I'm sure you've seen them. And that is the column that says that is labeled Q2. Okay, so those are the actual. So between Q1 and Q2, actually, um, the growth rate for the first half of 2022 was 6%. And you can see the 5.2 was, uh, in Q2 was actually strong growth. And that's the way we need to appreciate that, uh, yeah, I mean, to characterize it as a strong growth. Um, the interesting one, I think, is agriculture, which was the, the one that was dragging the rest of the economy. So actually, we have, uh, in terms of growth, you can see it, it was a decline um, in Q2 of minus 2.1. We actually had been projecting an uh, sort of a stronger growth in this, uh, in, this ag in this sector. But the other services was obviously very strong, growing at 7.7, uh, um, and uh, we expect that that will remain. And of other others, industry also, you can see that was a signif significant growth at 5.6, and we expect that dynamism will remain. Bottom line is that we expect the annual projection the, uh, on an annual basis, that is for 2022, to have the outcome at around 5.6% of GDP. And this is quite strong. Bear in mind that there was the sort of uh, elections in August, and uh, and also the pressures from the international sources, as we mentioned before. So all that put together, but we still land on our feet. So it proves the resilience, or it points to the resilience of the Kenyan economy. We've talked about this in the past. A lot of it relates to being highly diversified in terms of the various sectors, etc. So that's what I want to say about the overall growth. Uh, but for 2023, we are tentatively projecting a number like 6.1% of GDP. Um, but that is a number that obviously will revise as, uh, as we go forward. Now, let's go through quickly some of the indicators, um, sort of um, leading indicators. And this is a sales turnover on uh, wholesale trade. And the one on the right, right is uh, manufacturing sector. Um, the, the blue line, the dark blue. Uh, at, the, at the top uh, is really shows the, the turnover in terms of Kenya shillings, millions. But I think the growth rates are the green bars. And you can see that has continued strongly. Yeah, around 10%, you have 15% in the wholesale and retail trade, um, and then 8% in uh, October etc. and also on the manufacturing. I think the point here to make is that uh, there is a, clearly there's a lot of dynamism that has been shown in these numbers and we expect uh, that that will continue. If anything it will accelerate um, as we now um, get into the Christmas season, um, shopping etc. and also the back to school um, in early January or in January. So I think the point here is that uh, Clearly, this is an uh, indication of strong activity that will be sustained. Then the next one is on power consumption. Um, I think we understand where, what this relates to, and you can see the green bars, that's the growth rates. Uh, the blue, dark blue is uh, the levels. Um, but then switching all over to the large power consumption, um, you can see the same, the same um, trend is uh, repeated there. Um, August was a low month. I think we all know why. That was the elections. And so a lot of the um, manufacturers, etc., consumers of um, electricity um, had shut down for that period to allow people to go home, etc. And so the consumption was limited. So next slide is on uh, construction. This is cement manufacturer sales turnover. 
Um, this is a bit puzzling. Uh, I'll, I'll then show the, the, the consumption and production in a minute. This is just sales turnover. And the July, August, um, you can see the decline May, June, and then July, August, significant decline. Um, and I think the reason here, we had said that it is related to two factors. One is the, the closing of, uh, or the, the closing off of some large, um, pro uh, some large projects, the expressway, et cetera, that was consuming a lot of cement. Um, but you can see it's picked up in terms of sales turnover. Um, now, we still have not got to the bottom of this, I have to be honest. Why is that? Because let's look at the next slide. The next slide is on cement consumption and production. So this is in tons, yeah? Um, so you'd expect that uh, this is what relates to um, uh, what I mentioned before, projects, etc. Now, in the slide we showed a moment ago, there's a pickup in the last two months. But here you can see there is, it isn't quite picking up. The, the, uh, the growth is, uh, is not a, well, the decline is smaller, but I think there's still a decline. So I guess a, a lot of this also relates to, I mean, between production, consumption, storage, uh, booking of, uh, of uh, transactions, etc. But anyway, what is clear is that we need to understand this better. But uh, it is something that I think uh, also shows that there is, uh, at least there is a, um, a recovery of a kind. Um, obviously, we are cautious about indicating that this is a recovery from these numbers because we haven't gotten to the bottom of that. Then transport um, and, com and storage, again, numbers are pretty much the same. Um, strong activity. And uh, accommodation, obviously, is something that uh, we were concerned about. This is your hotels, etc. cetera. Um, and I think uh, the numbers are quite favorable. Moving on to the next one, the last, the last slide is on private sector credit. Um, this now, as you know, is at 13.3%. So gentle growth, uh, which is what we we're expecting. And if you look at the sectors, the next slide, just uh, the, the sort of large sectors, manufacturing, trade, um, business service, and indeed even consumer durables. You can see there's a lot of uh, dynamism. If, if you connect credit with economic performance um, in, those sec in the private sector, um, but at least in those specific uh, sectors. Moving along, uh, the next uh, slides are about the CEO, about the various service. As you know, we do three service. We are now doing three service. Um, first is a CEO survey, and then the next one is a market perception survey, and the third one is on agricultural sector survey. So I only have one slide, uh, well, I think for the CEO survey, and uh, all that I wanted to show here is that there has been uh, uh, significant or sustained optimism. Um, you can see the totals on the left hand side, on the right hand side. Um, so you have companies and about sectors. So you're asking them about the confidence in the company, um, the prospects of the company, or, and also prospects of the sector. And looking at the far right, um, you can see in September, you know, those that were but the same or felt that uh, the prospects would be higher um, were something like 80, 84%. And, uh, and now you can see that uh, the, there has been a slight reduction in that, um, 82%, but, uh, but I think still quite strong. The reasons are clear, and uh, the CEOs did tell us um, why is it that there was why they were optimistic and obviously the end of elections and then obviously the settling in of the new government all those things lead to you know stability and indeed you know better prospects etc um, the concerns relate to high inflation uh, stronger u.s dollar which has been affecting everybody around the world as i mentioned and uh, possible global recession so you can see we are connected with the rest of the world 
Of course, global, con I mean, the drought conditions in some parts of the country um, was a concern, particularly for those uh, CEOs that are connected to the agricultural sector. Um, so not necessarily farming, but it could also be agro manufacturing, et cetera. The next one is from the market perception survey. And this, uh, this is something that, again, uh, points to significant optimism. On the left hand side, on the right hand side, you can see this is more for non-banks. Um, this is the respondents uh, were non-banks. And, uh, and yes, so there has been an increase, or let's say a decrease in their level of optimism um, from uh, some, I mean, the, the September, um, so almost doubling. Um, of the level of, let's say, those that are pessimistic or very pessimistic, the gray and the, and the uh, yellow, you know, at the top, um, from 13% to 24 And the question was, was why? And the respondents really pointed to um, the risks relating to high inflation, um, high interest rates, high cost of production. That was 60% of the respondents. And then uh, moderation in agricultural performance due to the depressed rains. So the rains were a significant uh, element here. Now, we did this survey at the beginning of the month, the first two weeks of the month. And uh, I think that was before the rains kind of got uh, to us, at least here in Nairobi, even though other parts of the country, there has been significant rains for some time. So it may be it may be a timing issue, meaning uh, those that were, uh, I mean, they were still seeing very dry conditions, including, I guess, on the newspapers, etc. Moving along, the, the next one is about uh, the hotel bookings. And this was from the market perception survey. And you can see that they are really strong. Um, you are talking in Mombasa, February, 60 plus percent. And this is forward booking, yeah? Now, as we all know, a lot of us do our booking sort of last minute or last day or last week. So the way things are now, um, it is clear that uh, there is a, there's, there's, much, there's a lot of dynamism in that sector. As a matter of fact, you know, already there are places that are completely booked, you know, fully booked. Um, you can compare that to where we were, let's say, earlier in the year, a, a year ago. Um, November 2021, December, and you can see the, the, the sort of uh, forward booking uh, numbers were much lower. So things have stabilized. Mind you, it's not just Mombasa, it's across the board, including the rest of the country, right? Rest of the country at 40% in February, uh, for February 2023. I think that is pretty good. Moving along, uh, this is uh, market, I mean, the, the agricultural sector survey. And uh, I think there's a lot of material there in this survey, but also in the others. And this one, the only thing we had, well, maybe the only two things I would want to put out here. First is the, the respondents expect uh, to have an increase in output um, in the next harvest relative to the last harvest that they had. Um, and uh, the only one that obviously is a bit of a concern there is tomatoes and onions. For those of you that are into kachumbari, well, you are so warned. So tomatoes and onions. Um, but the others, as you can see, there's an increase and uh, pretty much increase or remains the same. Um, we can talk a bit more about the details, but I think the, uh, the one should, I should at least say, that we expect the, rain, the ongoing rains will boost the fast growing crops, you know, mainly vegetables. And, uh, but we also know that uh, a lot of rain will affect negatively the um, production of tomatoes, so there's, there's that concern. Moving along, the, the next one is about the problems in the agricultural sector as reported by the, uh, by the respondents. And uh, all I want to say is transport costs, input uh, prices, and whether conditions account uh, for sig uh, significant factors, um, at least from the perspective of the respondents, that need to be dealt with. Um, 
please look forward to the, uh, the surveys which will be published um, by tomorrow midday, uh, 12 o'clock. Uh, we should put those on our website. Thank you very much on that. Let's move on now to the balance of payments. And the balance of payments, I think, have been uh, quite strong, favorable. Um, the goods, goods exports, that's uh, merchandise, um, they remain strong. Uh, grew in the 12th month to September, relative to the 12 months to September last year by 13.9%. And, uh, and I think we expect to see similar growth uh, for the end of the year, that is for, for the year 2022. I, th I think this is a good slide. You can see tea has been quite strong. And uh, there's a question about horticultures, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but most exports have been quite strong. Um, the average price on tea, let's talk about tea, you can see has, uh, compared to last year, have been stronger. And, uh, and I think this is what is coming through um, in terms of the outcomes. The next slide is on uh, horticultural exports. Um, horticultural exports, there are two items that I think are worth flagging. One is the uh, cut flowers, that's a deep green. And uh, there has been a decline in that. And actually here we are not sure, um, we haven't really tied uh, the bow of this. We haven't tied all the loose ends. So we have some partial understanding what's going on. But I think the point here is that it has, uh, it has stagnated, um, at least compared to where we were before. And we are not sure if it is a production issue entirely, or it is actually just a, a demand issue from the, uh, from the countries. I think there, there, there's a, there are potential, let's say, both issues. Um, what is, so this is something that I don't want to speak too much about because I, we haven't tied the book as it were. But on the fruits, um, the big one there was avocados. That is the decline as a source of decline. We've talked about that before. But uh, as you can see now, it's picking up um, in Q2, Q, well, more like Q3. Um, and uh, because we now have, uh, let's say, ready markets, um, we are exporting those fruits to China and I believe India as well. So there's a lot more uh, potential in that regard. So now moving on to imports. And on imports, I think here is simple. Uh, it has increased, imports have increased by 18%. But really what has driven this is oil, oil imports. That increased, as you can see, from 2.9, uh, 2 um, actually 3, uh, 3 billion. Uh, U.S. dollars import for the six for the 12 months to September, um, that is 2021, and then for sep to September 2022, it is 5.4 billion. So actually, um, if you, in a sense, uh, just looked at everything else except oil, everything else except oil, all other imports except oil, actually, oil imports would have. It, it would have all other imports except oil would have grown by 5.5%. 5.5%. And you can see that is, keep, that is not quite keeping up uh, with, well, rather it is keeping up with the, with the, with the, with the, with the real economy. You know, we talked about growth of 5.6, etc. So it would be aligned uh, to that. Um, so I think the point to make that on the oil imports, on the on the import side, the only significant item to sort of keep track of is oil. Here is one that shows the product, rather the imports by type, consumer, uh, capital, intermediate, pretty strong growth in uh, intermediate um, uh, products. So that relates to manufacturing, etc. And indeed also consumer, uh, consumer output, uh, consumer durables and other things, or consumer imports which um, we expect to see and uh, also expect to see a slight increase as we come to the end of the year because the imports should have come in November, early December um, for us to buy whatever it is that we are going to buy around Christmas. So that's uh, what I would want to say about the imports, but there are other things to mention about uh, uh, the, uh, the 
the, uh, the balance of payments. Um, services, exports, a lot of this is travel and also tra transport receipts growing strongly. I don't want to say too much. That's a very busy chart. Um, this is an even worse chart, I think, in terms of presentation, but there it is. Tourist arrivals, um, probably the way to think of it is the dark blue in the, uh, that is right there in the middle, uh, is chasing the, uh, uh, the, the light blue. The light blue is from 2019, which was sort of like the best year that we had had then. So it's going to that. It's already overtaken the 2021 performance. But I think the point here is that we are going back uh, to um, where sort of like the strong performance of yesteryear, you know, of uh, previous years um, in terms of arrivals, etc. Diaspora remittances remain strong. Um, and uh, this is something that we expect will be quite strong to the end of the year. As a matter of fact, now we expect to see the strongest inflows as we come to the end of the year. December is always a very strong month. And uh, November depends on uh, many things, um, timing, etc. But uh, whatever will happen, the inflows in November and December taken together will be quite strong, or we expect those to be strong. Okay, moving along, um, current account has been, we have re-estimated the current account deficit at 5.6% for the year uh, to, for the year 2022. And uh, that is down from uh, 5.9 um, that we had before. By the way, for the 12 months to September is 5.3% of GDP. And uh, I think that is, uh, we have all, we've made this point again and again that our sweet spot for the current account is around 5%. So we are in, the, in that range. We are, in the, uh, we are within the range as it were. Then exchange rate, you have the standard, um, the standard charts. I'm not gonna talk too much about this. Just to say that uh, we have, our currency has depreciated by 8%. Um, and the US dollar is the one that has been driving everyone else. Um, this is the index there is ag again relative to the major uh, currencies. It was up to 14, 18% and now it's down to 12. Actually it's come down the last two weeks, but it's still 12% above, I mean over all the other currencies. And then uh, looking at uh, our local currencies, um, we are at 8% and you can see where the other currencies are. Um, much, uh, well, various levels. Um, but I think we've made the point again that uh, we want to be sort of in the middle. I mean, we are okay, you know. Um, and uh, even as we know that there's a lot happening, I want to underscore again our, our exchange rate policy. And our exchange rate policy remains that we have a flexible exchange rate regime and uh, we intervene. Um, only to minimize volatility. So the exchange rate policy has served us well um, through the crisis, not just this one, but all of them, the plural of, those, of all the crises that we've gone through. And it has served as well as an automatic stabilizer, um, adjusting more quickly uh, before other policies can be put in place. So I think we are comfortable with the outcome that, of uh, that set of policies. Now, this is the exchange rate cover, uh, foreign exchange cover. So the question here is, okay, the this, this central bank holds reserves uh, for quote-unquote rainy day. And, uh, you know, obviously we use the reserves to make payments for the government. And also it, is, it serves as that sort of fund, you know, rainy day fund as it were. Now, this come, it has come down to seven, almost seven billion. Uh, US dollars from uh, a much a peak of almost uh, 9 billion um, a couple of years ago. And, uh, and I think the, and in terms of uh, percentage of, uh, or rather months of import cover, um, as was indicated in the press release, this was uh, 3.94 uh, months of import cover. Um, now there's, uh, I, I need to make a couple of points there. Um, so it is, what, what really is the policy? What are we shooting at here? 
And I think I'll make two points. First is according to our act, uh, at all times, uh, we are supposed to at all times use our best endeavors to maintain a reserve of external assets at an aggregate amount of not less than the value of four months of import cover uh, calculated in a particular way. Now, it's interesting that the numbers we are giving you here are not exactly this. I need to make that point. Actually, the numbers that we are giving you uh, relate to usable foreign exchange reserves. So in that sense, it's not just the assets. It is assets net of uh, some liabilities. So you can imagine that it is um, lower than uh, where really the external assets themselves, which are not netted, you haven't netted out anything, would be. So we do understand that difference. And we had indicated before that there's about uh, maybe, anyway, there's, there's a margin there um, because we do have some liabilities that we, we need to net out. So from our perspective in the central bank, we've always wanted to have something meaning to watch. You know, think of your dashboard. Um, uh, you're looking at something that, uh, yeah, that, that will give you warning, etc. That is meaningful. And uh, from our perspective, this is why we have been monitoring that foreign uh, usable foreign exchange reserves rather than just looking at external assets. Although actually the bank, uh, the CBK Act, and indeed also the ESC Monetary Policy Protocol, Monetary Union Protocol, uh, talks only about external assets. Um, now there's also that word best endeavors, and uh, we have to appreciate best endeavors. It means that we have to do what, it is, what we can to make sure that that happens. And therefore that means that uh, occasionally um, there may be moments when the number is, even with your best endeavors, the number may be lower than uh, the target. And so the best endeavors from our perspective today uh, has meant uh, uh, two things. One is uh, we've looked ahead, we've looked forward, and we expect some inflows to come in. So we are not waiting, you know, in a sense, uh, we are projecting inflows, some of which I can tell you. Um, IMF uh, disbursements at the conclusion of the, of the review, which we expect will be completed sometime in December, and uh, that would allow a disbursement of about 440 million, the equivalent of 440 million US dollars, so something like that. Then there'll be others later in the year um, from the World Bank, uh, large amounts, I mean, relatively maybe not relatively large, but any 400 million at this moment can increase all the way to even one, one billion. Um, there are also other IMF uh, transactions or disbursement that will take place by June of uh, next year. So there, there is actually programmed inflows and uh, that gives us comfort that we are doing our best endeavors in this regard. In terms of uh, the payments, yeah, a lot of this is, uh, um, is virtually payments for government debt, um, and those are programmed. Um, so we need to make sure that those are paid. And uh, so there's, that's how the, let's say, the best endeavors e equation is uh, put together. Um, moving along, I want to make a few points on the, on the uh, and I'm now conscious that I've been talking for too long, so maybe I should bring this to a close very quickly to allow you time uh, for questions. So I, I'll only make then two points about uh, banks. Um, their liquidity levels and capital levels remain okay, adequate, and uh, we made that point in the press release. But I think the two developments that uh, have happened recently, first is in the credit information uh, sharing framework and uh, and this is something that we obviously there has been concern from various members of the public and everyone else um, that this could be improved and we have uh, we tightened it we've been working with the CRBs that's the bureaus the credit reference bureaus and also the banks because it works both ways um, so fast in terms of making sure that the records are correct and, uh, and that is something that we've been working with the 
with the CRBs, make sure that their their uh, algorithms for calculating credit scores, uh, you know, world class, etc. So that is an ongoing sort of work uh, work program. But uh, I think that has that's going well. Um, secondly, the issue of making sure that uh, um, the your credit score is not the only thing that is used uh, for your um, for in determining whether you be given credit or you know lending, etc. And now, if you would go to your own, if you would look at your own credit um, report, at the top of the credit report, you know it is quite clear. Uh, it says that uh, um, this in the information, the credit score is um, it should be used in addition to others. It's not the only issue. The only, the only let's say it shouldn't be used only on its own for uh, for making a judgment on lending etc then we've also worked with the commercial banks to make sure that they actually understand this and are tweak tightening let's say their risk based pricing remember this is a journey we've been on because really the two work together so if they are looking at the risk based pricing they'll look at the potential borrower and understand risk as uh, how risky is that person um, based on a variety of information of which the credit score is one of them. Um, then there was the, so I think that has made, we've made significant progress, but again, to understand that this is a journey and, uh, and it will in the end be beneficial for all of us because at the end of it, uh, we need to have borrowers benefit from their good uh, their history of good payments. So it is important to appreciate that it is not all negative. There's the positive side, which we should distinguish those that are good borrowers and those that are you know, not so good borrowers. And therefore the person who borrows, um, who repays con as per schedule, would generally get um, a better, ter better terms for their uh, future borrowing, etc. Then the last point I wanted to mention is on the credit, in, um, credit repair framework that uh, we approved recently. We, we talked about it, I think. Um, but I think the point here is that uh, this relates to um, borrowers that were, um, that had borrowed on the digital platforms, right? So these are sort of the digital lenders on them shoreys, the um, the Fulizas, etc., um, and uh, and really there were about well maybe to put it differently, um, the idea here is to work with the borrower um, to repair their credit record, and so the banks have uh, let's say subscribed to this credit uh, repair framework and have communicated to each of the um, their borrowers and uh, those, or indicate those specific borrowers, um, indicating that there will be a 50% waiver on whatever is outstanding, and then a six-month program, or it could be sooner, you know, the program has to be within six months of, uh, uh, by May 30th next year, um, and uh, being given an opportunity to actually have uh, repair their credit score and indeed their credit well, also the credit history in this regard. Having said that, um, it, just to throw a few numbers at you, in total there are about 19 million unique borrowers with CRB records, right? So 19 million unique borrowers. Um, there are three CRBs, and uh, I could be, my information could be in all three of them for the same loan. So it's important to sort of uh, figure out is it how many people are there. And we are making the point that there are 9 million uh, unique borrowers with CRB records. So that's the universe, right, from which the credit score is calculated. Out of this universe, 12 million unique borrowers have records of performing loans. And this is, let's say, until uh, this was uh, when, before we started this uh, credit repair mechanism. So there are 12 million. And then the balance, the seven million have records of non-performing loans. So you have a loan that is non-performing uh, in there. And, 
And this includes 4.2 million with non-performing mobile phone digital loans. And that will be worked out through the credit repair framework. So those are the big numbers. And uh, I think it is something that uh, uh, we are happy with. Um, there are those of you that are concerned about the impact on IFRS 9, etc. And the point is, yes, it has nothing to do with IFRS 9. IFRS 9 remains the same. And uh, banks re uh, com will remain completely compliant with IFRS 9. Um, and this, is on this only relates to the other side, which is reporting to CRBs. I'll stop there, and uh, I'm conscious that I took a lot longer than I intended to speak. So I'm ready for your questions. Thank you. That was the Governor of the Central Bank, uh, Dr. Patrick Njeroge. And we'll jump straight into the questions. Uh, we begin with Julian Zamboko of NTV. Uh, Julian's question is, with uh, foreign exchange reserves at 3.9 months of import cover, breaching the recommended floor, does CBK still have buffers to smooth out volatility? Uh, the next two questions come from Kefa Moirore of Radio Citizen. Uh, the first one is, how does the CBK see lower interest rates as desired by government, uh, which is 10% on Treasury yields, panning out amidst the uh, current environment, which is high inflation and high rates? Uh, the second question from Kefa, how would uh, the Central Bank of Kenya assess the effect of the previous two rate hikes on the economy, given both the continued rise of inflation and a weaker exchange rate. Okay, thank you very much. So the first question on the 3.9, I think I explained this. Uh, I explained this and uh, Julian's, you should also appreciate that there's no, it's not like a trap, you know, when you get there you're caught. Meaning it's not, uh, you know, things are not, uh, it's not like an accident, right? The moment you are below a certain number um, you, you know, stuff happens, whatever that is. So, and this is why I spent a bit of time explaining that, uh, you know, so if you have 4.1 and 3.9, are they really different? No, absolutely not. Um, but in terms of calculation, um, they are different. Um, so, so this is where maybe we all understand when somebody tells you, okay, fine, you know, what is this number? Divide X by Y. And then you are given, I don't know, a number by in three or four or five decimal places. It doesn't make sense to, uh, to do it that way. So what point am I making? We still believe that uh, we have adequate cover um, to smooth out any volatilities that, uh, um, that would come. Um, we also know, as I said, we are doing our best endeavors uh, to ensure that we get results, and this is why we are not uh, stressed, as it were. Um, and, uh, and so w in terms of the CBK continuing to perform its function in the markets and elsewhere, also the, the function of payment of, uh, um, you know, for government, uh, external payments, etc. Oh yes, we have absolutely, we are very clear, we have absolutely no problem continuing with that at 100%. Then the question about uh, lower interest rates as desired by government according to KEFA, um, how does that sit against uh, um, our, the environment of high inflation, etc. Maybe to take both questions together, also the question about the previous rates, you know, how do we assess that? I think the point here is that we all desire a lower uh, interest rate environment. And that is clear. But I think we also have to prioritize things. I spent a bit of time explaining the dangers of high inflation. So, and also explaining, yes, yeah, explaining the dangers of high inflation. So the, the first order of business is to deal with inflation. And then the others will get to, yeah? So once we have inflation, um, interest rates will come down. And in a sense, the lower interest rate regime is sort of like in the near term, right? In the, or medium term, in the future. And we'll get there. But the macro balances that need to be there in the economy, um, that is essential. So let's deal with the most urgent problem and then we'll get to the others. And I think that's the, really the approach that we, 
we have taken. And uh, that is, and all these many years we've been taking that approach. And, uh, and, and you can see the benefit of it. Um, you have already seen the declines of uh, interest rates from the very high levels that, uh, um, that were there, let's say, in 2015, 2016, and even subsequently, um, and to then more normal levels. Are we saying that the current levels are the ones that will stay forever? Of course not. We want to even go lower than this. But again, inflation was unexpected because of all these external pressures and food, etc. And so we have to take action to deal with that and uh, realize that uh, it temporarily goes in the wrong direction um, if one is desiring to, um, to have a lower regime. But I think this is where you need to, you know, let's say, uh, two steps back uh, before jumping, right? Um, so I hope that makes sense. In terms of the assessment of the hikes, we did this and uh, all I can say is the, I'm talking of the, KEFA is talking of the recent adjustments in May and September and the impact of that is sloshing through the system, yeah? It is still, um, let's say, as I said, it takes about nine, uh, well, 60 days, 90 days uh, to really create, uh, to, to sort of get, uh, let's say, some uh, impact on lending and the rest of the economy, sort of the interest rate sensitive components of uh, aggregate demand. The next batch of questions, we begin with David Herbling. Uh, David Herbling is from Bloomberg News. Uh, do you think Kenya's inflation has peaked or do you still see prices rallying? Julian Zamboko uh, from NTV, does the CBK have any plans to reverse the CRR cut, uh, that's a cash reserve ratio cut, effected in April 2020, and herald the law of the people daily? Uh, the Central Bank of Kenya ordered the delisting of about 4.2 million borrowers, yet most digital lenders have not been cleared. Are you not concerned about this? Okay, so the first question, I don't know, I mean, whether it has picked or not. Uh, I don't think the point for me is to, is to sort of come out with a point estimate. Yeah? So we are not doing point estimates. What is clear is there has been in, inflationary momentum and we need to turn it. So whether we have completely turned it or whether there will be an additional sort of, uh, um, let's say, month or two where it's, uh, it hasn't fully turned, that many factors. Um, we talked also about uh, food as one of the key drivers. And that is, your guess is as good as mine. We've done the survey, etc. But uh, does that mean that we are very, let's say, sure? Yeah? How, how comfortable are we? How uh, firm are we that uh, um, the price of maize, um, the price of milk, the price of wheat, yeah, the price of edible oil, the four commodities I mentioned, um, will actually be turning, meaning coming down and not continue to increase or remain flat. So we, in that sense, turning points are the most difficult things in economics to, um, to, to predict. And, uh, and therefore we are not going into that sort of, uh, um, let's say, full serrated of, uh, um, making predictions on things that, in our view, it doesn't matter. What is clear is we are addressing the momentum, inflationary momentum that is there, and uh, the policies that were put there, we believe are appropriate, and uh, consequently, we would expect the prices to begin to come down in the near future, or rather inflation, not prices, inflation to begin to come, the inflation outcomes to begin to come down, and. Uh, and uh, hopefully in the, in the next quarter, um, sometime the next quarter, early next year, um, we would see the outcomes back in the, in the, uh, in the target band. Um, Julian's asked about the CRR cutting and reversing this. Um, no, we haven't. I think uh, the Monetary Policy Committee has taken appropriate actions. Um, knowing that that number is out there where the CRR was adjusted to. So at this moment, um, those policies are sufficient and they, we don't see a need today 
to have additional policies. If we needed additional policies, we would have put them in place. Um, and that was not the case. And uh, uh, Herod's question, I don't know, Herod, I, I, you're telling me that uh, yet most digital lenders have not been cleared. I don't know what that means. Um, so I just explained how the numbers stack up. And if you indeed you had a loan to, uh, to a digital lender, Herod, let's do this. Why don't we, I'll send, Wallace will send you 100 shillings and you will go into your CRB and look for your, uh, your record to see where you are. Um, my point is that if indeed you're, you had a digital loan, uh, Fuliza or any of those things, they are part of you. They must have contacted you by now to tell you this is the situation. Now, the only problem is you, you may have had other loans that you probably uh, were also having, you hadn't been, were not performing. Obviously, that is that you have to deal with. So let's be clear where the facts are. And uh, the facts, as I explained them, and of, the, of all the ones that have digital loans that I mentioned, um, by now they should have received a message from their, um, let's say, their, their lender. And if not, then get in touch with them. Get in touch with them. Um, so I, I, let's leave it there because I, I think there's a bit of misconception here, and I don't know where the misconceptions are. And Harold, maybe Wallace will send you 100 shillings and then you tell me uh, how, what your credit report looks like. Uh, <clears throat> so 100 shillings promise has been made. The final question uh, is from Martin Mwita uh, from The Star. And uh, Martin is asking, with yet another Fed rate hike, uh, I assume that's a Federal Reserve uh, in the United States, another Fed rate hike expected in December, where does this leave the shilling amid the continued high demand by importers? Okay, Mwita, uh, I, 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 I guess there are two things here. Um, let's understand where the, how the, the hikes or the in increases in interest rates by the advanced economies, uh, central banks, in this case the Fed, how is it affecting us? Maybe the channels that you are mentioning may not be the ones that uh, uh, this is coming through. But I think the point here is that uh, increases in interest rates um, in the U.S., what it was doing is it was um, attracting, let's say, a lot of capital into the U.S. market. And as a matter of fact, it was the U.S. market because there was also a differential pace between the, the ECB and also the... Uh, well, Bank of England was more or less on track, but anyway, ECB and uh, the, uh, the, the Fed. So that is really, so the, the action was taking place in the financial markets, right? That's basically it. And, uh, and we are actually not so connected with those markets directly, meaning we, we, we don't have, we are not like the Canadian dollar or the, uh, um, the, the, the UK pound, etc. So the point here about the pressure on the shilling, um, it's really on everything else, right? So in a sense, it's where everybody else is, is uh, dropping um, because the US dollar is pushing um, everybody down. So it's going up, everybody else is going down. So that, of course, mutatis mutandi, there are some things that obviously I'll skip in this sort of uh, stylized sort of uh, description. The point here, though, is that all that for now, um, it is clear what, uh, for the most part, actors have incorporated those sort of um, decisions um, into their actions. So in some sense, you have, um, uh, there's a sort of expectation of that already happening. It's not a surprise. It is the surprise elements that, that drive markets a lot more. This is why the US inflation outcome um, was a bit of a surprise and therefore it drove markets because everybody felt that the U.S. will have to be less aggressive than it had stated it would be. So I don't think there is, a, at least in the short term, um, we, are, we, are, we remain where we are, where we were, meaning in a corner. 
with all other EMs in margin market and frontier economies. So I don't see that as being a new piece of information that will drive the markets. What will drive the markets is something else, which is maybe an, a new piece of, a surprise piece of information. I didn't mention this, but I think I should, uh, I should have, which is to insist on uh, the real, the number one problem of, uh, as we see it today, which is uh, the danger for a financial accident. And we are talking of a financial ma accident in the, in the emerging market space, or for that matter, the, the, um, the markets as we saw them in the, um, the advanced markets, let's say, the financial markets. You know, think of what happened with the, uh, um, the cryptocurrency world, yeah? And uh, yeah, sure, that was an accident. Maybe people should have foreseen it, etc. But you can imagine having, you know, this is still a small piece of, uh, the, of the entire financial sector and actually not connected to the more traditional parts of the financial sector. So the point I'm making is having an explosion of just one or implosion of one particular entity um, can have significant shock waves that would be felt not just in that market, but in all markets and indeed um, much further out. So that is sort of like the number one uh, concern that keeps most of us awake at night. So just wanted to throw that at you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. Uh, that brings us to the end of uh, this press briefing. <clears throat> and uh, as is usual, uh, we do these press briefings after every Monetary Policy Committee meeting. So we expect the next one after the next scheduled Monetary Policy Committee meeting in January. But as a press release says, uh, if there's any need for the MPC to meet earlier, uh, that will be communicated. But for now, thank you so very much. And if we do not see you again, do have yourselves a happy holidays and a happy new year and see you when we see you.